you got a Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter 2. Normally I leave her up here, but... Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you loving Jesus today? Are you loving Jesus today? Amen. I feel like that was so underwhelming. Are you loving Jesus today? And come on, yes. Luke chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken in all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Carinus was governor of Syria. I have no idea how to pronounce that name. I'm going to be honest with you. I just made that up. Thank you, honey. Verse 3. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him, and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Can you say amen to the reading of the word? Amen. Father, we love you today, and we pray that you would just come and dwell, dwell richly among us, that your love would increase in our hearts, and, mm, and we would, wow, and we would draw closer to you by the power of your Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost of God, you are our honored guest today, and I pray that you would move mightily today, and you would ignite a passion in our hearts for Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Such a lovely crowd today. I, uh, I don't ever get to wear ties uh, because I don't wear ties ties unless, unless I'm doing weddings, and y'all ain't getting married like you used to. I just need more weddings. I don't need you to get married again, please. No, I don't need that. But I would like, just we just need some single folk to get married up in here, right? Uh, amen. 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 Stop clapping, son. We're not quite ready for that. Not, not quite... And the singer over there, she's fine for, a, you know, a good decade. So let's not, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. But all you other ones, y'all are ready. You're ready. I'm ready. And it's time. I, I, wear, I wear ties normally at weddings. Well, actually, every time I've done a wedding, I've worn a tie. Uh, I do no funerals because my people don't die. Hallelujah. We're just waiting for Jesus to come back. Like obedient children. Amen. He said, wait here. I'll be here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So today uh, we celebrate uh, Jesus coming to earth. We celebrate the season that our Savior was born. And it's good and proper to pause and reflect on this season. Now, there's no feast that's mentioned in the Bible that tells us we should remember this day. And Jesus told us to remember certain people who served him. And uh, he never told us we were supposed to celebrate uh, his birth. Uh, as a matter of fact, Jesus didn't tell us to celebrate anything, but it's a reasonable response to celebrate people you love. Amen? Amen. It's a cultic thing to not celebrate the birth of people that we love. And uh, we're just going to continue to celebrate the birth of Jesus. When was Jesus actually born? Who cares? <laughs> we're celebrating it. On the 25th. Amen. And since it doesn't matter what day it was, we can celebrate today. Amen. Merry Christmas. It doesn't matter. He is eternal, so I don't know that it does. But it's good. It's good to pause and reflect on these really, really important things because we get so familiar with these things. We get so overly familiar that we forget the power of them. Does that make sense? In life, we can get so in a rush to get through life that we miss it. We don't spend enough time pausing and reflecting on the important things that we have because this world is so obsessed with getting us to obsess over the other. Whatever you have, this world says you need something else. 
No matter what you have achieved, this world says you need to achieve more. No matter how much money you have, you need to earn even more than that. Wherever you were last year, you need to be ahead next year. Whatever you have now is not important. It's what you can get tomorrow. And uh, as a young man, uh, I was very eager to achieve the most I could. And as I get older, I appreciate the things that I had more than when I had them. Let me explain. If anybody in here has grown children, you long for the days of holding your baby once again. Amen? You long for the days that your child was tiny and the world was filled with possibilities. And you seem to forget that they screamed all night long. You seem to forget the blackout craziness that comes from not sleeping for days on end and how your marriage was on the very brink, the very precipice of destruction because of this alien creature that has come into the home. For some reason, that gets blocked out unless someone else gets pregnant and then you get a little belly laugh about it. And all God's parents said, Amen. <laughs> Not only should you get married this year, you should get pregnant as well. Because we like to hold the little ones. <clears throat> but when you start to get middle-aged and older and you talk to people, rare do they reflect on that year they got a bonus. They want to talk about the year their child was born. They want to talk about the year they got married. They want to talk about when maybe the loved one got ill and they nursed them in their dying years. They talk about the great wonder and buying your first home and the struggles that you get through. And we can get so excited and so caught up in doing these things that we forget to reflect on these things and savor the moment that we're in. Just like we rush through life, we can rush through our faith. So concerned about the next thing, concerned about the next teaching, the next breakthrough, the next miracle, the next promotion that we don't stop and just savor, wow, I've actually been saved by the living God. The God of heaven came and moved into my heart and now lives with me. And I'm in a community of people who have met him and love him and love me me. We can forget to reflect on this. We can forget to appreciate the fact that I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was living in darkness, and now I have light. I used to not know God, and now I'm a child of God. Just the simplicity of being saved. It's so easy to forget what it was like living in darkness with no hope. We forget what it was like to not know where to find God or how to hear His voice. <clears throat> and this world would like you to live in that place. Always want you to consume more. Always want you to desire more. Hear me. Want you to devalue what you have for what someone else has. And today we just reflect and we say we just are thankful for having Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and so we rush through life without really considering our lives. We rush through our careers. We rush through our days. We rush through raising our family. And we don't stop and reflect and slow down and look at what we have. I want to challenge you this holiday season. And in 2020, I want you to purposefully reflect. I want you to create memories. And by that, I mean, I want you to stop. I want you to sit at the table with your loved ones this holiday season. I want you to look at the, maybe the holiday card that someone gives you or the gift that you get in the mail or the call from the distant relative. And I want you to just stop. I want you to look around the room. Then I want you to close your eyes and I want you to remember it. I want you to take a snapshot of these special moments that you have with people and sear it in your brain, sear it in your memory so that years down the road when the enemy lies to you and tells you you're alone, you can close your eyes and you can remember that moment that it was not true and it still is not. 
I want you to appreciate the relationships in your life right now, even the ones that are strained. I want you to remember the family who raised you or the spiritual family that poured into you or the, the teacher that loved you when you were having a hard time. I want you to reflect on these things that are so easy to forget for the other. I want us to appreciate what we have. Now, I want you all to get ahead. I want you to prosper. I want you to be better next year than you are this year, but I don't want you to discard this year for next year. So many years I was excited to escape, and now my wife sit around and look at pictures and wish we could live them one more time. So I want you to reflect, you know. I want you to see some things that you might have missed this year. I want, you to, I want you to think about things in your life that you haven't thought about in a while. And I want you to reflect on them. And as an example of this, I want us to, uh, what we've been talking about in this church is kind of defamiliarize ourselves with the familiar. Yeah. To kind of lose focus on something that we've seen too clearly so we can see something we hadn't seen before. Remember in the 90s, they had those pictures in the early 2000s where you had to like get unfocused to see the picture that was in it. You remember those? They just look like a big blue-green blob until you lost focus and then you could see it. Sometimes that's how we are with our lives. We need to lose focus and really look at it from a fresh angle to see what God has given us. We can't see it because we're too familiar with it. We can't see how far God has brought us. We're so familiar with the struggle, we don't see the victory. And we're so familiar with the story of Jesus, sometimes we miss Jesus in the story. The real, living Jesus, who put on flesh because He loves us. As a little exercise this morning, I want to kind of look at this birth story very quickly to maybe slow down and look at it for fresh eyes. Does that make sense? Now, as we read the Bible, we see here in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, it says that a decree went out from Caesar that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. How many of you know that's not exactly all the inhabited earth that came? So we see all the inhabited earth, but it doesn't actually mean all the inhabited earth. I mean, you would agree that there weren't people in South Africa making a trek up the continent because Caesar said he wants to count people. Amen. And you would agree that there weren't Native Americans wandering across the Great Divide so they can go through Russia and China to make their way to the Middle East and be counted. We just take it for granted that in this instance, all doesn't actually mean all. But when was the last time you thought about that? We need to defamiliarize ourselves to get familiar. Let's take a look at the manger itself. Put up my... Our graphic here, our series graphic. Popularly, we're known that Jesus was born and there was no room at the inn, as if there was some Motel 6. And Jesus was then put in a barn. Mary and Joseph went and rented a barn because that's all they had. And they got this wooden manger, whatever a manger may be. And they put Jesus in it, and that's where he lived initially. Well, as we've talked about before, those who have been to Israel know there's not much wood there. And the precious little wood they have, they're not making feeding troughs out of it. So what really happened? Well, we know in those days that uh, most likely where these animals were kept was in a small cave. And they didn't use wood for most things. They used stone. And we believe, and it is given by historians, that this manger, which is a small feeding trough for small animals. See, when small animals, they, they couldn't fight with the big animals for food, and they would build a little feeding trough, and they put some hay in it, and the animals would come and lick their food out of that. And, you know, it's carved out of stone. And so we see that Jesus wasn't placed in this wooden thing. The first time we saw a wooden manger uh, is when they were trying to introduce Europe to Christianity, and they made the whole birth scene look more European. How many of you know Jesus was not born in Europe? So I want you to picture this now, this story that we've known our entire lives. So the Son of God was placed in a stone cradle. Hmm. We know when he died, he was placed on a stone slab. And when he was born, he was placed in a stone slab. He was on an altar when he passed. He was an altar 
when he was born, we see the bread of life was born and placed on an altar for the young ones of the world to come and feast. There's more to the story than we see at times. Amen. There's more to the story. We need to defamiliarize ourselves what seems so familiar because we miss what God is trying to say in the midst of it. Now, um, they never started my clock, so I'm going to start preaching now. Is that okay? <laughs> Not actually. I'm very hungry. I'm looking forward to eating. <laughs> there is another call on my life, and it's the Sunday brunch. Hallelujah. And the ladies of my family heard that. Here's what I want you to hear. Hear what I'm saying. <clears throat> there are shouts coming at us in every direction. And we get so tuned out to the noise of life, we can miss the opportunities God is sending our way. God has brought such fruitfulness in our lives that we can miss because we get over familiar. But opportunity comes in whispers, not in a foghorn most of the time. And we need to slow down and take a look at what's happening around us and defamiliarize ourselves with things that we've taken for granted so we can really appreciate the things God is speaking. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So we find our Savior, Jesus, who was before time began. And everything that was created, the Bible tells us, was created through Him by his word. Jesus is the word of God. The Father had thoughts. Jesus spoke that being the word into existence. The Holy Ghost was at move forming everything that Jesus Christ spoke. And this God who was before time decided to save us. Now, in the midst of this census that was happening, I want you to see this. There's this juxtaposition that we see in this scripture. So Caesar, who considered himself the king of kings, called everybody to come to him so they could be counted. Jesus Christ, the real King of kings and Lord of lords, came to us so we could be counted in the book of life. Yeah. It's in the same story. And we can miss it, amen? What a beautiful God we have that has stepped down from his throne to come and save us, that we may have the life that he laid down, Amen? I'm pretty excited about Jesus today. I'm pretty excited. And so our Savior, Jesus, comes and he's placed in a little manger. What, what, is there any less noble place for the King of Kings to be born? Is there any less royal place for the Lord of Lords to establish his kingdom than rejected even at the inn while going to be counted by Caesar. Is there any less austere beginning for a royal than we find here? Yet we know our Savior was showing us that in His kingdom, things would be different. His kingdom is completely different than the kingdoms of this world. His kingdom is completely opposite of the kingdom of man that says you don't have enough, you need more, you don't measure up, you're not good enough. The kingdom of God says that I have loved you and I've accepted you and I call you home to be with me. Can you say amen? <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm torn today. When Jesus shows up, he does stuff. When Jesus shows up, he speaks to people. When Jesus shows up, he shifts things. And the people who really meet Jesus are rarely the celebrated ones in society. The people who truly know the King of kings and Lord of lords will not settle for an imitation. We, we, we find John the Baptist is out in the wilderness, and he knew the one who was coming, even though he had not met him as the Messiah yet. And we find him in John chapter 3, verse 16, telling anybody who will listen. He, said, he says, I baptize you with water, but one who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. 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 
I just, I feel the presence of God. I'm so excited about it. Forgive me. I'm distracted because he's here. He'll baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. He has not only come as a messenger, the word says, but he would have the power to actually connect you with God. This was the promise that was on the life of Jesus. Now, before he could connect us with the living God, he had to take care of the one who disconnected us in the first place. Now, we know that man was created to live in community with God. Amen? Hello. Yes, we were created to live in community with God. But in the garden, man sinned and he fell short of God's glory. And he was separated from God. I am freezing in here. Did somebody touch the air? Mike DeCarmo, did you turn the air down? No. I'm freezing. I'm never cold when I'm preaching. Are you guys okay up here? They all look like they're... All right. Mike, leave it where it's at. They say they're good. I'm freezing. It's the fire of God. Hallelujah. So God came to connect us. Jesus came to connect us with God. And before he could do that, he had to deal with the enemy. Now, here's what's really funny. Jesus is eternal. Can you say amen? amen. He's forever. Amen? Yes. A thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years to him, right? It's in the book. I'm just letting you know. Yeah. I'm fishing for amens right now. Okay. Okay. This is a participatory sermon. And so we know that John the Baptist baptized him in water. He came up out of the water and the Holy Ghost of God came upon him and he was taken into the wilderness by the Spirit. Now, here's one of the funny things in Scripture to me. I find a lot of things funny in Scripture, but what's funny is Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days with the enemy like 40 days meant something to Jesus. He's eternal. He's been around, watch this, forever. And the enemy thought 40 days was going to do something. Like after an eternity... In creating everything that exists, the enemy thought that 40 days would make him say, ah, never mind. I just give up my throne. You're totally right. I find that humorous. And so Jesus and the enemy in the wilderness, Jesus was not defeating the devil in the wilderness. Jesus was letting the devil know he was defeated in the wilderness. You see the difference. You already have the victory in Christ, even if you don't know it yet. What Jesus is doing is teaching you that you have victory in him. That's a good word. Thank you. Mikey, that's a good word. He's not up there fighting the devil over you. He's already beaten the devil for you. He's actually defeated. You're like, well, I don't feel like it. Well, that's because you didn't defeat him. He did. Do you have any idea what it would feel like if you had to actually defeat the devil? That's a bad day right there. Considering you don't have the blood of Jesus. It's a good word, Corey. I'm just going to pound that in a little bit right there. Hallelujah. So Jesus, after letting the enemy know. All right, I'm just going to share this. The Lord's been talking to me about 2020. And... uh, He is going to be sharpening focus in 2020. He is going to make Jesus so very clear to people in 2020. We are, we, are, we are going to see Jesus so very clearly in 2020 for those that will press in and those who are willing to lay down the things that are separating us to him. He is, he is, we are going to see Jesus so clearly this year. Amen. So Jesus... They say defeated the enemy in the wilderness. Really, the enemy failed in the wilderness with Jesus. And after the enemy failed in the wilderness with Jesus, Jesus comes out, the Bible says, in the power of the Spirit. Then Jesus went to the synagogue that he had ministered in uh, previously, and he opens up the Bible. And he opens up the Hebrew Scriptures, and he opens to Isaiah, and he reads this as was recorded in Luke chapter 4. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Can you say amen? Amen. 
Amen. Here's what God's going to be doing in 2020. So Jesus modeled something for us here. Now, if you look at it with fresh eyes, Jesus read to them the prophecies about himself. He told other people the prophetic word over him. And he was like, I got a big calendar in heaven. And on my calendar today is Isaiah chapter 61, where the Spirit of the Lord comes upon me and I begin to establish my kingdom. This is today, by the way. And I'm just reading it to you to let you know what the date is. You think you know the date, however you don't. Today's Isaiah 61 and I'm coming into mine now. Amen. Now, I think the Lord is saying that some of us need to dig up some old journals in this year. We need to dig up some old prophetic words. We need to dig up some prophecies that have been buried for seemingly eternity and begin to read over them in 2020 and find out what the date is on those messages that perhaps we thought was in 2019 or 2018 or for some of us 2009 or 2007 and say, this is the year of the Lord's favor in my life. And we need the Lord to breathe on some of these words and say, the date has come to pass for this now. to come. We need to start looking at these prophetic words and believing them over our lives. There's nothing more powerful than resurrected hope. When you're young in the Lord and you get one of those words and you're like ready to get coronated, right? You're ready for the scepter of the Lord to come upon you and everybody see it. Now I'm going to come into mine and the Lord's like, well, let's just soften the field of your heart with a decade of disappointment, right? Let's just <laughs> seemingly... <laughs> I'm not speaking for the Lord there. I'm speaking for me. <laughs> and there's something about being brave and believing them again. Yes. Understanding the cost of disappointment that you might have to spend to mix faith with them. What, what I love about this is Jesus in his own words here is saying what he was called to do. Now, <clears throat> as an aside... I'm hearing a lot of people speak for Jesus these days. I'm hearing a lot of crazy nuts, crazy stuff being spoken. <laughs> what I say? Crazy stuff. Or it's nuts. Nuts so crazy. Whatever. <laughs> crazy things people are saying about Jesus in his name. And I'm like, have you actually met him? Yeah. I'm hearing stuff spoken by the media comparing people to Jesus. And I'm like, have any of you actually met him. Now, I've seen a little of Jesus in a lot of people, but I've never seen anyone who looked like Jesus. And I've never seen anybody that I was confused, Mikey, that, oh, wait a minute, this might be Christ in the flesh right here. That has never happened to me. You say amen. I, that's never happened. And I've seen, and I just, as a pastor in Boca Raton, I have to say this. I've heard people in the last week being compared, their little trivial life issues being compared to the sacrifice of Jesus. And I'm like, you need to put some respect on that name. That is the name Jesus Christ. And it is the name above every other name. Maybe you haven't met him, but I have. And we need to return to a little bit of reverence for the man Jesus. Jesus in America. No, he is not your political leader. No, 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 no. You have not met him apparently because he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He is the Son of God and he is the way, the truth, and the life. Maybe you don't have him as a Messiah, but you can receive him. But you need to, like I said, put some respect on that name and stop calling your idol the Messiah. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 Listen, I got no king but Jesus in this place. I got no king but Jesus. I don't got time for this nonsense. I'm a little worked up about that right there. You ain't talking about my Savior like that. I don't think so. Not with me sitting by just looking at it. Don't blaspheme in my presence. I'm sorry. Mm-mm. tired of this nonsense. I feel like I might make some enemies in 2020. But I'll have a friend in Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. They have some, some reverence for the things of God. Amen. 
I have some reverence here. <coughs> Son of God died on a cross. I'm sorry. Let me just stop going down that road. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to see him clearly this year. Do not be afraid to say, that ain't Jesus. Uh uh. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't let them own the narrative. It's my Savior. Let's focus, shall we? <laughs> Speaking that over myself mostly. Hallelujah. I get a little worked up here. My wife said, suave. Suave. Hallelujah. In Luke, he tells us what he was called to do. And he tells us very clearly the mission of Jesus, to give good news to the poor. It's to bring freedom from bondage, to give us clear vision. And he declares the end of oppression. The end of oppression. And in 2020, we are going to slow down and see what Jesus has done for us. Now, next week and the week after that, I'm going to do a two-week series. Watch this, watch this, watch this, called 2020. Or watch this, watch this, 2020. Watch out, watch out. Yeah, 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 okay, yes. We're so prophetic in here, right? I talked to the Lord. I was like, Lord, I need a word for the new year. He's like, 2020. I'm like, no, please no. That's so cheesy. Please no. (laughs) Come on, not that. (laughs) Come on. And then he started speaking to me from Scripture, and I'll share that on the first Sunday of the year, what he spoke. And you're going to be like, oh, okay, that's not cheesy, right? Uh, And we're going to talk about seeing Jesus clearly in two weeks. Next week, uh, I, I have this message um, that the Lord has put on my heart. It's how to discern the Lord's will, making big decisions with God. Yeah. It's going to be very, very clear. It's going to be good. Come next week, I'm going to talk about how to discern the Lord's will in big decisions. It's going to be good. Amen? So we're, we're here, one service. What time? 10 a.m. I'll be here at like 7.30, so come whenever you want, all right? Very quickly, I want to... I wanna, I wanna, I'm going to close up here very quickly. I just want to talk about a couple things that happens when Jesus comes. First thing, when Jesus comes, he makes our barren areas pregnant. He makes our barren areas pregnant. Now, we know that Mary could not have a child because there was no, no action for the faith. Amen. There was no, no reason for her to be. She, she, they were just in faith at that moment, right? Faith without works is dead. Amen. And so there, only God could bring life into the body. Help me out here, honey. <laughs> only. So. It's crazy. Not so even. Hallelujah. Here we go. When Jesus comes, he makes our barren areas pregnant. He makes barren, he, that's what he does. He just brings life. Now, it's really easy to believe that in the abstract. I want to challenge us this year to have active faith yeah. and say, where in my life do I need Jesus to come and bring life? Where are the barren areas of your life? And I'm just believing in many of your lives and your finances and your relationships and some of y'all single people get hooked up, right? I'm just believing for fruitfulness in life in areas that are barren. I'm believing that businesses will take off. I'm believing that faith will come alive. I'm believing that your, fa- your families will get saved. Because when Jesus comes, he makes our barren areas pregnant. This is what he said. Second thing he said in this passage of scripture, what happens when he comes When Jesus comes, he releases us from the tyranny of the devil. The devil is a horrible God. He's an absolute horrible God. He has us serve him and gives us nothing in return. He only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. John said about Jesus that the Son of God appeared for this purpose. Watch this. Why did Jesus come? To destroy the works of the devil. He came to destroy the works of the devil. And that is not just sin and death. That's in your life. That's anxiety and depression. That's 
poverty. That's, that's the areas of your life that do not reflect the kingdom of heaven. He's come to destroy those things. He's come to destroy the family dynamic that keeps us from loving one another. He came to destroy the dynamic that brings infidelity. He came to destroy the dynamic that causes people to lie and cheat and steal. He came to destroy these works of the devil. He came to destroy them, not to pacify them, not to counsel them. He came to destroy them. You say amen. amen. We see in this passage that when Jesus comes, we'll see truth clearly. Now, for the demoniac who's getting freed of the devil's tyranny, this freedom looks like now I don't have to live crazy anymore. I actually have an ability to live in life. In John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And when Jesus comes, when the real resurrected Jesus shows up in our situation, we see truth so clearly. <clears throat> I uh, have the honor of counseling people in major life issues and dealing with conflict and dealing with major family disturbances and major life decisions. And often they're just torn trying to come to a decision. And I get the honor of telling that God is not the author of confusion. God is never the author of confusion. When God shows up, He brings peace. So if we know that there is confusion, we know there is a lie at work among us. But the truth of Jesus Christ is so very clear to see when we want to see it. And when Jesus shows up, He doesn't hedge His words. He doesn't bend to try to appease people. He just brings truth. And he lays before us life and death, the Bible says. And he says, hey, you can choose whatever you want, life or death or blessings or curses. And then he gives us kind of the cheat sheet. And he says, choose life. Yeah. Choose life that it may be abundant with you. Come on up, Mike. Last thing I want you to see in this passage of Scripture, when Jesus comes, the things holding us down have to go. He told us, good news for the poor, freedom from bondage, clear vision, and the end of oppression. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I'm praying for 2020 and beginning today for abundant life in the lives of the people of Revival Life Church that this year, Beginning, hear me, today. Not only will we move into new abundant life, but we would appreciate the abundant life He's already given us. Maybe today you're dealing with a sickness. Maybe you're struggling financially. Maybe you have a loved one who's going through a family falling apart. Or maybe you lost your job recently or your business is folding and it seems like the end of the road. I'm here to let you know that is not the plan of God for your life. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus Christ laid his life down so that we can come into this abundance that he's promised us. And this abundance looks different than the abundance that the world has to offer. This abundance brings peace. Watch this. It brings satisfaction. It'll bring you a life that you don't have to escape into your phone to avoid. I had a crazy vision. It was like that. It's going to sound silly and simplistic, but I believe it was God. <clears throat> we believe in the God of the impossible, amen? I saw a group of people. You think I'm making this up? I'm not. I saw there's a group of people that were all together without their phone. I had an actual vision. It was a group of people, and they were laughing, and they were just present enjoying the people they were with instead of escaping into a porthole with other people in their phone. <clears throat> the prosperity of knowing God 
comes with appreciating the prosperity that comes through the relationships in Christ that you have. And in this year, I want you to savor those because I believe God wants to multiply it. And as we honor and are thankful for the blessings He's given us, He's going to multiply them this year. Say amen. amen. Stand with me if you would. <clears throat> I want to close with a prayer. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't give an opportunity for those who are maybe away from God to come into this blessing. And so here's what we're going to do. Um, if I can have the prayer team come forward. And we're all going to pray together. Here's what's going to happen. We're all going to pray together. I'd like nobody other than the prayer team to be moving around right now. If you're pregnant with twins, you can sit. So nobody moving around. What we're going to do right now is we're going to give an opportunity for those who are away from God. To just kind of get right with Him. This is between you and God. Jesus didn't single people out like that, and I'm not going to either. So if you all... Everybody from the sound man to the prayer team, if you would close your eyes and bow your head. Now, I don't believe there's anything holy about the back of your eyelids or the ground. This is just a way for people to stay anonymous before man, but to be seen by God. And I want you to just look at the landscape of your life and say, is Christ at the center? That Jesus Christ, who stepped off his throne, was born... Among the animals, laid where those animals have been eating. That Christ who came down, is He at the center of your life? If you're not sure, let's look at the fruit of your life. Are you living in the abundance of God emotionally and spiritually? Or perhaps you have hope in another. I want to challenge you today to put your hope in Christ. Put your hope in Jesus alone. We're going to say a prayer together. We're going to ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins and to wash us clean and come into our lives. So we can start afresh. And just like he was born in that day, so many years ago, he could be born again in our hearts. Can you say amen? So let's pray. Say, Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. I believe in you, the Son of God, born from a virgin, never sinned, murdered on the cross for me, buried in a grave, but resurrected for me. I believe in the man Jesus Christ. Come on, let me hear it. I believe in the man Jesus Christ. Ha! The Holy One. My Savior, pierced for my sin, bruised for my shortcomings. Now receive Him today as my Savior. Come, Jesus. Wash me clean. Give me new life. Live on the inside of me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. And give me power to be a witness. Give me power over sin. And give me a heart for you. And I'll tell the world about what you have done. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, come on, give a clap out for the Lord. Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time today, Corey's going to come up and pray and he's going to invite people to come forward for prayer. Now we're going to ask people to come forward for prayer if you need healing in your body, if you need freedom in your life.
or if just you want someone to stand in agreement with you on someone you're praying for. But if you pray that for the first time or you're rededicating your life to Christ today, I'd like you to tell one of these people at the front or tell somebody in the lobby so they can get some little information and we can get you walking with Jesus in this new year. Can you say amen? Listen, love your family in this holiday season. Come on up, Corey. Love your family. Cherish those around you. God bless you. Amen. Please don't go anywhere. My wife and I are going to go into the lobby so we can greet you. Just stay where you're at for one moment. Amen. Can we give up for a word this morning? <laughs> I love the presence of God. I love the presence of God. So something we do in my family uh, on Christmas is the night before, on Christmas Eve, we, cut, we sit down with the kids and uh, we, we read... Um, I think we usually bounce around to a couple of different gospels, but it's mostly out of Luke. We'll read the, the birth of Jesus. Um, and, and we just want to make Jesus not, not something we add to, to Christmas, but the center, the center of it, right? I, I, when I gather around the table and eat with my family, I want it to be done because of what he's done. I want him to be at the center. I want to actually have communion because of who he is, right? So I just would like to encourage you this week as you get together with friends and family. That you may have prayed that prayer for the first time today. And this may be the first year you actually have the opportunity to put Jesus at the center of what this whole thing is about. Or maybe you've been saved for a long time. I just want to encourage you, again, just to keep him in the middle of what you do with friends and family this year. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you pray that prayer for the first time, a uh, pastor mentioned a couple things. He said to fill out a connection card before you go and just write on there that you got saved today. Also, you can come up here and let one of these people know they love to pray with you. But more important than either one of those things, I want you to come back next week. If you pray that prayer for the first time, I want you to come back to church next week because God has more for you than just a prayer. Amen. Can we give it up for Jesus one more time this morning? Merry Christmas for Revival Life Church. We love you. Have an amazing Sunday. Love on someone before you leave, and we'll see you guys next week. Merry Christmas.